Please turn your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I want to open up by telling you guys a story about Glenn Cunningham. Who here knows the story of Glenn Cunningham? Okay, you guys are going to learn. <laughs> so Glenn uh, was a seven-year-old boy, and his job was to arrive to school early because he was supposed to light the heater to warm up the school so the school would be warm when all the kids come. And so he would do this every day. It would help uh, his parents pay for his way into school. And he got really good at it. He just comes in, strikes a match, lights the heater, and within a few hours, the school would warm up. Nice. Well, one day, Glenn comes in, same as always, but the person whose job it was to put fuel in the heater the night before, instead of putting kerosene, accidentally filled it with gasoline. Oh. And so when Glenn, same as every day, strikes the match to light the heater, the heater explodes, wow. nearly killing him, and it severely cripples his legs. Ooh. So Glenn is rushed to the hospital, and the professional opinion given by the doctor is they need to amputate because he could die. And for whatever reason, his mom decides not to go through with it, says that they'll take their chances. So Glenn miraculously lives, but his legs are severely deformed, and he cannot walk. So years go by, and Glenn is uh, stuck in a wheelchair, and he's watching other kids walk, run, play. And one day, Glenn is looking at a steel fence, and he gets this idea, I'm going to roll over to the fence, and I'm going to try to stand. Oh, wow. And so he goes over, and although it causes excruciating pain by putting his hands into the fence and doing everything he can to lift himself up, trying this every single day, after months, he's finally able to stand. Wow. And then he gets in his mind, okay, I'm going to try to take steps along the fence. And of course, this causes extreme pain. So he tries to take a step and he collapses. And every day, for months, he does this until he's able to walk back and forth along the fence. Then he decides, I'm going to try to walk away from the fence. Again, extreme pain, falling down to the ground again and again. After months, years have gone by since the accident, he teaches himself how to walk. Oh. Wow. In 1938, 17 years later, Glenn broke the world record at the Olympics for the mile, running wow. it in four minutes and six seconds. Wow. It's an incredible story. How many of us would have just resigned ourselves to a life of immobility? Ooh. Never questioning the limits that others had put on us, and yet always questioning why God had done such a thing to us. You know, Glenn's story is inspiring because it demonstrates the heart of a champion. Mm -hmm. A heart of purity. Mm -hmm. Who here desires a pure heart? I hope you do. If you don't desire a pure heart, then you sort of miss the whole point of what we're trying to do here today. Yeah. Yeah. And yet I put before you that purity comes at a far greater price than what most are willing to pay. Yeah. Gold is one of the most valuable resources on earth, and yet it is also easily tainted. The only way to get the actual value of gold is it needs to sit through hours and hours of a refining fire. And only when the gold is just in the, in the furnace, in the flames, it melts down and then the impurities can be stripped away. And then you're left with what is the value of gold. The title of the lesson today, A Pure Heart is Forged by Fire. Come on, the Bible talks about the heart more than 700 times. Wow. If we're not talking about the state of our heart, then everything we else we do is pointless. On, bro. We have to learn how to have a pure heart today. Yeah. One of my favorite scriptures about the heart, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, many of you probably know it. It says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. Wow. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Right here, Samuel, his task is to anoint the next king of Israel. And so he goes and he has his line up in front of him. And apparently someone real tall and handsome comes up. Maybe looks something like our brother Amari over there. Oh. And he's like, man, this is probably the guy. Yeah. This is probably the king. And God tells him, Don't, uh, watch yourself here. 
I'm not looking for what's impressive by human standards. I'm looking for the purity of the hearts. You know, uh, evidently, our uh, sister Tiffany also looks at the heart because she's dating Christian. Amen. Hey! And uh, this is good news for a lot of us. So we know that it's true. We know that it's possible. Someone can look at the hearts. Proverbs chapter 4 says, guard your heart, for it is the wealth spring of life. Mm -hmm. A pure heart is the only thing that's going to keep you faithful to the end. Mm -hmm. So today I want to learn how to have a pure heart. Right. Let's, go, Let's go to Luke chapter 18. Come on. You, you just feel me today? Yeah. yeah. All right. Come on, bro. All right. I, I, I... You're feeling it. You're feeling it. You're jamming today. <laughs> So uh, I, I like when this is sort of like a, a participation thing. Let's go. So right. uh, I'm going to give you guys a task here. All right. You guys need to be the thermometer for the service today. Come on, bro. So a thermometer, it's not responsible for making anything hot. But if something's hot, the thermometer lets everybody know. Yeah. Oh, I'm so if you're feeling it, you got to let somebody know you're feeling it. Okay. Is that fair? Yeah. Come on now. All right. Preach, bro. Luke chapter 18. In verse 18, I have two points for you guys today. Come on, bro. The first a lot longer. The second one shorter. Okay. Point number one, God will expose your heart. Mm -hmm. God will expose your heart. Luke 18, verse 18. The Bible says, a certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony on your father and mother. All these I have kept. Since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, You still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was very wealthy. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Here you have what's known as the rich young ruler. Three characteristics that we probably wouldn't mind being known as he's rich he's young and people do what he says hey. by worldly standards like he's got it going on mm -hmm. he comes to jesus and asks what is in my mind a very fair question jesus how do i go to heaven if you had one shot to ask jesus a question you might ask the same thing just making sure here like how do i go to heaven yeah. and jesus in response to this guy's fair question gives what in my mind is a totally unfair response First, he has the word study with him. He says, follow the Bible. He's like, okay, good. I'm all set. I do follow the Bible. He says, okay, but one thing you lack. Isn't that funny? Don't you guys remember hearing at church that you only need to do one thing to go to heaven? All I got to do is just believe. All I got to do is have faith. All I got to do is accept Jesus in my heart. Jesus actually says the opposite. He says, if there's even one thing you won't do, then you can't get into heaven. Come on, bro. You're doing everything. Okay, what about this? And he says, you have to sell everything you have and just give it away. Come on, bro. Then you can come follow me. It's not even a part of following Jesus. It's a prerequisite to following Jesus. Yeah. No one else is given this expectation. And what is his reaction? Come on, bro. He's sad. He just puts his head down. And he's sad. Why? Because deep down, he knows that he is unwilling to do what Jesus is calling him to do. Yeah. Wow. Here, turn your Bibles to Mark 10. I want to look at the Mark accounts. Mark records the same story, but I think he adds two more details that can help us flesh out the full picture here. Let's see if we can find them. Mark 10, verse 17. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud on your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. What are the two things we see here? What are the two additional things we see? Yeah, but he looked at him and Jesus looked at him and loved him. So this is not like some sort of cruel thing that Jesus is like smirking at him about. This is coming from a place of love. Yeah. Now, the other thing I like here, it says he comes and he falls on his knees before him. 
And the look at Cal, you sort of get the picture. He approaches him as a peer. Hey, good teacher. Let's talk. Let's chat for a second. No, he falls on his knees before him. Mm -hmm. People do this. They fall on their knees before God. God, I just want to go to heaven. I just want to have my sins forgiven. What do I have to do, God? And, and they fall on their knees. And they have this outward display of penitence. But deep down, they're not really looking for what they have to do. They're looking for affirmation that what they're already doing is good enough. He wasn't looking for the answer. He was looking for a gold star, a good job, and you've got to change nothing about what you're doing. So confident in self-righteousness. And Jesus, from a place of love. Why? Because he's able to see right through him. He's able to see the thing that's going to stop him from getting to heaven. Is Jesus cruel? Does Jesus just want to see you fail? Is he trying to make this harder than necessary? No. He knows you better than you know you. And he knows that you're not going to be able to get to heaven unless you have a pure heart. And he's able to see what it's going to take for you to purify your heart. Because a pure heart is forged by fire. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Let's go, bro. God doesn't want you to fail. God loves you. And he loves you so much, he's willing to do whatever it takes to help you become what you need to be to get to heaven one day. Hebrews chapter 12. We're going to read one of my least favorite passages. I do not like the scripture. But because I've had to read it, it's only fair that now you have to know about it too. You're getting older. Hebrews chapter 12. Read with me here in verse 7. It says, oh. endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. Okay. The Bible says endure hardship as discipline. Yeah. Not endure some hardship as discipline. We think, okay, is this hardship, this one might be from God. This one's from the devil. No way oh. God would do this to me. Oh. No, it says endure hardship as discipline. All hardship yeah. is God disciplining you. Yeah. Remember when you first became a disciple, you were so humble. You just wanted to learn all the time. Yeah. You could fall down a flight of stairs. You're like, man, what's God teaching you? You gotta be secure. But the longer, the longer you're a disciple, the more far removed you are from this heart where you desire to learn. You start to get prideful. You're no longer looking for the lesson in things. But it says all hardship is discipline from God. You get fired from your job. What is God teaching me? I'm too invested in money. I'm I'm not I'm, I'm not being useful with my time. Stuck in traffic. God's teaching me how to be patient. Get hit by a car. I, I gotta watch where I'm going. All hardship. All hardship is from God. Let's keep reading. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good in order that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The Bible teaches that God is your father and he will train you through hardship. You know, the scripture is written in a way where it assumes that everyone who's reading it has had an earthly father who has disciplined them in this way. Mm -hmm. This makes sense. It's written in the first century where divorce is not rampant. There is not a rampancy of single mothers who raise children by themselves. But today there is. Mm -hmm. So a lot of us, we read the scripture and we actually do not fall under this assumption. Mm -hmm. We did not have a father who was available or they did not discipline us the way God disciplined us. It? So, so what it is, is because we don't understand this seemingly like fundamental ingrained thing, uh -huh. we have a skewed perception on this concept and it makes discipline from God very, very hard to grasp. Mm -hmm. okay. Why? Because when the scripture says we all had fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. For a lot of us, this was not our experience coming into the kingdom. Amen. We don't know what this is like. Amen. For us, dad disciplines me because he's having a bad day. Yeah. But the scripture is teaching, no, no, the, the discipline is because you did something. Yeah. It's not like he did something to me. No, it's you did something. And the hardship is God lovingly disciplining you through it yeah. to 
to try to train you. He does it for our good. But many of us, we just refuse to accept this. No matter how, how clear it is, no matter how many times it's told to us, we refuse to accept it. We cannot take responsibility for what we do. The fact that we are greedy, the fact that we are prideful, that we are dishonest. No, I, I'm not prideful. I'm not dishonest. And that's how we feel. But God actually sees that you are greedy. You are prideful. You are dishonest. And he loves you, but he will not tolerate it. And he will bring hardship in your life to purify it out of you. Because we're incapable of purifying it out of us ourselves. But we fundamentally reject this. And we'll never say we're mad at God. Like this guy, oh, he looks like he's having a bad day. Hey, who are you mad at? I'm not mad at anyone. I'm mad at the situation. I'm just frustrated by my circumstances. What are you really saying? I'm mad at God. It's just like Proverbs 19 verse 3 says, a man's own folly ruins his life, but his heart rages against the Lord. And so we do some bad things and our life isn't going so hot and we feel the discipline from God. We're like, God, why are you doing this to me? But it's not out of hatred. It's not out of frustration. God does not discipline out of frustration. God disciplines out of patience because he loves you. So what happens to us when we don't understand this concept? What happens to us when we don't understand God's love? When you do not endure hardship? When you are not grateful for the discipline? Well, in short, it makes you bitter. And we're going to spend a decent deal of this lesson talking about this concept. Jump down to verse 15. So he talks about how all hardship is discipline from God. God is treating you as his children. In chapter 12, verse 15, it says, See to it. That no one misses the grace of God, and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and defile many. It says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God. Yours might say, see to it that no one falls short of the grace of God. Well, what is the grace of God that's talking about? In context, the grace is that God considers you his children, yeah. and he disciplines you as such. Yeah. In context, that's what he's saying. We are not entitled for this relationship with God. We do not deserve for God to view us as his children and be involved in this way. But God is not a negligent father. He's not an abusive father. He's a loving father. And so the grace here is the whole thing that it just taught. Sometimes we read a scripture, we see like a word, and we just kind of impress our own meaning there. We read into the text instead of reading out of the text. What does the text say? The grace of God is that he is your father and that he has instituted this dynamic with you. It says, see to it that no one misses this. What happens when you do miss this? It says a bitter root grows up, causes trouble, and defiles many. We are all going to wrestle with bitterness. Sometimes people get so offended when someone suggests that they might be bitter. Bitterness is simply the result of not handling hardship in a spiritual way. Who here is going to handle like every hardship in a spiritual and righteous way every time? Yeah, yeah, you're not going to. So you acknowledge that you are not above falling into bitterness. Like no one is going to just meet every single challenge and just be like Jesus every single time. It's two plus two equals four. Me plus me not being Jesus equals I'm going to be bitter sometimes. So someone says, bro, I think you might be bitter. And we're like, oh, you don't want to go there with me. I am a peach tea from Georgia. <laughs> Extra sugar. It's like, no, you are not. You are a 99.9% .9 concentrated dark chocolate bar. Oh, oh, I'm extremely bitter right now. And everyone can see and accept it. Wow. See, we're all going to experience disappointment in life. So, sometimes we think that hardship is like a disciple thing. Or that, like pain is like a kingdom exclusive thing. Hardship is a life thing. Yeah. The only difference is hardship outside the kingdom means you will not be trained by it. Hardship in the kingdom actually leads to your benefit. It helps you grow as a disciple. And so bitterness will settle into your heart. But this is where you got to make a decision. Will you be humble and embrace the hardship of Christianity? Or will you get prideful and start to play the blame game? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been caught in like serious pride? Yeah. 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 It just reduces you to a child. Yeah. Like, did you do it? No. 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 But you totally did it. Yeah. Man, nothing will expose this more in you than marriage. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I remember uh, after Alyssa and I, after we first got married, you know, I was feeling like I'm doing a pretty good, like she's a very blessed lady. <laughs> like we're like a month in, I'm like, wow, Alyssa must be like really great for now. <laughs> I, I, I'm killing it. And so in marriage, sometimes you'll do like uh, married D times. Oh. 
between husband and wife, and to this day, no husband understands how this should go. And so I, I went to her, and I was like, hey, uh, is there any area of growth that you have for me? Is there, is there like a way, a way that I can improve? You know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm doing a good job. And so, but she doesn't, she doesn't say, hey, you're perfect. She actually says, hey, there is one thing. I would really appreciate if you stop leaving things open and leaving things out where they're not supposed to be. So I, I hear this, and I was like, okay, so you're good then, because I don't do that. <laughs> and she's like, no, you do do that. I'm like, well, can you give me an example? She's like, no, I just cleaned the house because you made a mess everywhere. And I was like, well, that's convenient, isn't it? Like, there's no example right here. <laughs> and she says, you know what? Okay, I'm going to point it out to you tomorrow. So, you know, when she says that, now I'm, like, super aware. <laughs> Very cognizant. I get up and brush my teeth. I, like, I put that cap, like, I twist it back on. Oh. And, and, I, and I put it back in its spot, like I always do, right? I put it back oh. And so, uh, Alyssa leaves. You know, uh, the day goes by. I make lunch. I do something. Uh, Alyssa comes back. She comes in our room. She says, hey, Jordan, can I show you something? Oh. Oh. Sure. So I go with her to the kitchen. And like every cabinet door is open. <laughs> and, and, and this is me being like really aware of what I'm doing. Every cabinet door is open. The solid shakers, not everything. And she just shows it to me. And I'm like, she's like, how did this happen? I was like, well, clearly, <laughs> someone came in through the window <laughs> and opened up all the cabinets. And I'm just so prideful, I look like an idiot. <laughs> Because pride just reduces you to the maturity of like a five-year-old. Oh, and everyone can see it except you. Yeah, yeah. You know, an another really nasty element of bitterness is that it is predatory in nature. Mm -hmm. When someone is bitter at someone, rarely will they take it to the person they actually have an issue with. Mm -hmm. Why? Because that would require like humility mm -hmm. and like trying to resolve conflict. Yeah. But bitterness is not interested in resolve. Bitterness is interested in destruction. Yeah. Bitterness is interested in tearing down. Yeah. So what will happen is you become like the rich young ruler. And your issue is actually with God. And you reach this point of frustration with God. And you're on your knees, but deep down you just resent the hardship that he has brought in your life. That he's, that he's trying to train you with. What happens is you become critical. You become pessimistic. And then what happens, this, this sin is predatory by nature. So it will look for those who they deem as impressionable. Or vulnerable. It's not even intentional. You see this all, all the time with divorced parents. The kid will be with the dad, and the dad tells the kids that, hey, the divorce is all your mom's fault. And it just jacks up the kid's perception of their mom. And the kids go with mom, and mom tells the kids, dad doesn't love you anymore. And it just jacks up their perception of their dad. And this is the crazy thing the parents were not intending to mess up the children. This is just the natural result of bitterness just festering in their hearts. Yeah. And it grows up and it defiles people. Yeah. People even do this in the church. They get like really mad at like a leader or like someone like me. What, what, what's really happening? They're super frustrated at the hardship God has brought in their life. But what are they going to do? They're going to look for the people who might be feeling the same way. They're going to look for people who in a subconscious way they deem as impressionable someone that they can lead instead. And this bitterness is just a poison and they just you it on people yeah because bitterness is looking to destroy wow. and they just get to this point like yeah it's not our fault it's, it's everyone else's fault Good. yeah i'm totally in sexual sin and, and i don't contribute yeah. anything and i barely barely ever show up and everyone's happy and i'm miserable but it's their fault wow. it's not my fault what has happened you've just been a victim of bitterness wow. how many people don't talk to their parents anymore because of bitterness. Ooh, ooh. How many parents don't talk to their children anymore because of bitterness? Yeah. How many siblings? How many people who were the best of friends at one point, but they're just so hurt, so much undealt with pain in their hearts, mm. and they just can't move past it? Mm. You know, the first siblings of the Bible, one brother killed the other wow. yeah. over bitterness. Ooh. Let's learn something from them. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. <laughs> Let's look at the original case of bitterness. Genesis chapter 4. It's Cain and Abel. In verse 3 it says, In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, 
Will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So we know the story of Cain and Abel. Who does Cain end up taking his bitterness out on? But who was his problem really with? He was upset with God. Why was he so upset? Why was he so upset? God, Because God was not proud of him. So he's offended that God is offended at what he did. How does that make sense? I'm living in sin. God is not proud of what I'm doing. Now I'm mad at God. But I don't have the stomach. I don't have the guts to be that straightforward about it. I'm going to kill my brother over it. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm going to project this onto someone else. He's upset because he's unwilling to do what's right. You know, I think there's an interesting developing theme here. What is he unwilling to do? It, this comes down to him not being willing to give his money. If you just read the text, he doesn't want to bring his grapes. I'll bet you he didn't even like grapes. Don't people say that? I don't even like money. I don't care about money. I ain't going to give it, though. Wow. Right, King? Your gra grapes aren't important. This is grapes. But you don't want to give us grapes. Same exact thing with the rich young ruler we just read about. Both, it's an unwillingness of giving up monetary possession. And what is the result each of them had when they met God in this situation? Sadness. They both get down on themselves. A prolonged sadness, even though nothing terrible has happened in your life, is often evidence of a refusal to surrender what the Bible is calling you to do. Wow. Mm. When you don't submit to God's discipline through hardship, it's just a torturous existence. You just end up sad. Yeah. And you feel miserable. Cain would go on to murder his brother. And then God comes to Cain and says, what have you done? The blood of your brother still cries out to me from the ground. He curses Cain and makes him a wanderer. Cain wanders the earth. He ends up having a son named Lamech. I want to learn something about Lamech here. Let's jump down to verse 23. Here we find Lamech. Lamech is the son of Cain. And in verse 23, it says, Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zella, listen to me, wives of Lamech. Hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. This is a bitter dude right here. And you know someone has like ego problems when they refer to themselves in the third person? Oh, Listen to me, wives of Lamech. Like, bro, you're the one talking. This is weird. <laughs> if you look at the footnote where he says, I have killed a man, at the bottom of your Bible, I think it says something like, or I will kill. I will kill a man for injuring me. I will kill a man for wounding me. He's not even saying anyone's done anything to him or that he has killed anyone. He's just saying right here, right now, if someone hurts me, they are not entitled to me overlooking that. I will see justice is done for me. If my father Cain was avenged seven times, I will be avenged 77 times. Wow. And I think in moments like this in the Bible, we read about that and we're like, man, he's the one with the problem. Not me. I'm doing way better than this guy. Well, let's learn something. Let's go to Matthew chapter 18. Come on, bro. Come on. Oftentimes, the Bible, the Bible's brilliant. It uses this literary device where you read what someone else has done, and you're like, what an idiot. And you think about it a little deeper, and you're like, oh, it's me. This is a story about me. You say, well, I would never kill anyone. Well, let's look here at Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. What is the clear reference that Jesus is making here? He's taking it all the way back to Lam like Lamech. You're just like him. If you're not willing to forgive your brother, you are like Lamech. You are like Cain. You are the murderer of your own brother because you won't forgive. See, Jesus came to bring the heart. They said, hey, I know I don't got to, I, I can't commit adultery, but I can look, right? Jesus says, if you lust, you commit adultery in your heart. And here he says, if you won't forgive, you have murder in your heart because the heart of murder is bitterness and rage. Wow. First John literally says, if you refuse to forgive your brother or your sister, you are a murderer at heart. Wow. If you keep reading, Jesus tells a parable to really get this concept to seep in. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him. 
cancel the debt and let him go. This is a parable. There's a spiritual meaning. The debt collector represents God. He says the time comes where he's going to settle accounts. This represents judgment. And here you have this person who is 10,000 bags of gold in debt. Why? This is an, uh, an unrepayable amount. You got to think, how does someone get down this bad? <laughs> if you're down 1,000 bags of gold, what possesses you to say, hey, I need another 1,000? I need another bag of gold. I was like, but we like, man, what is wrong with you? How do you just keep coming back and asking for more? In the same way, you would think that when we sin, at some point we would say, it would be unreasonable of me to expect God to continue to extend grace. Surely I've like maxed out my sin credit here. And, and I, I got to start like kind of dialing it back a little bit. Because I don't know if my good deeds are going to be able to outweigh my bad deeds. It would be ridiculous of me to expect God just to continue to overlook it and overlook it and overlook it. But who here thought like that? No one did. No way you thought like that. Right. You just sinned and you sinned and you gave in. You gave in with reckless ah. abandonment with no thought for what this would cost God. Oh, wow. That God has to repay it. So God ha tries to help us understand the gravity of his sin. He says, think of it like this. Your sin to me is like being down 10,000 bags of golden debt. Oh. For me to overlook this, no one's going to do that. And yet you come, you study the Bible, you have faith, you repent, you get baptized, you say, God, please have mercy on me. And God just says, done. Wow. Done. It's all forgiven. Yeah. That is how Jesus wants us to understand the gravity of the situation when you become a Christian. An insurmountable debt. Just gone. I'll even throw in a bonus. Take the Holy Spirit. Help you not mess up your life so bad again. Yes. Yes. Like, like we can never comprehend how ridiculous of a gift this is that's been given to us yeah. Yeah. you would think this would produce a heart of gratitude let's keep reading see what happens verse 28 but when the servant went out he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins far less than the ten thousand bags he owed he grabbed him and began to choke him pay back what you owe me he demanded his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him be patient with me i will pay it back but he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Wow. Yeah. A powerful scripture. It says God has overlooked every offense. And this guy who just had like, just a massive amount forgiven, he comes and one person owes him a little bit of money and he is very, very focused on justice for himself. And this is how we act. We've done such like we've done things to God. We can't even comprehend it. Then we justify I'm not really that bad. Someone does one thing to us and everything needs to get dropped. He needs to pay for what he's done. Yeah. He needs to answer for what he said to me. And we become fixated on it. And it says that when the other servants see, they get outraged. Why is that interesting? Bitterness is so obvious to everyone around you. Mm -hmm. You're the only one who can't see it. They come to God. It's clear as day. This guy is so bitter. We got to talk to God about this. When people, and then it says, God hands him over to be tortured. Well, I believe the torture he's referencing here is this is the experience of someone who refuses to forgive. Mm -hmm. They live out a tortured experience. Wow. God does not need to do anything to you. You will feel the torture of harboring the pain in your heart. Yeah. Yeah. Bitterness is like drinking a poison that you intend for someone else. Yeah. You're just so upset, so, so, so enraged at the situation. But that person does not lose a minute of sleep. Okay. And you're the one just weeping in frustration because you're the one who holds on to the sin in your heart. Yeah. It's a salvation issue. He says, if you don't forgive your brother or sister, God will not forgive you. Seems unfair to us unless we're actually real with ourselves and we see just how much we've offended God through our sin. Yeah. You know someone is bitter when they just keep talking about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes as Christians, like we know the right things to say. Like, hey, how do you feel about this? Ah, it's to a man's glory and honor to overlook an offense. I'm, I'm not worried about it. It's fine. It's fine. I'll be up with you guys. I am super bitter at a person named Kevin Durant. 
<laughs> yeah, do you guys know who Kevin Rand is? Yeah. So, I'm right this so before, before I just start rambling here and I give way too much context, I'll say this. I'm a big LeBron James fan. Uh, I think pound for pound, he's just a great basketball player. So, I gotta explain this for a second. So, the Warriors were the best team of all time by every metric. They broke the record for games one. It was crazy. LeBron still beat the Warriors in the championship. Kevin Durant, who's on a different team, is the second best player in the league. Kevin Durant joins the Warriors, yeah. making an insurmountable obstacle, and it messed up LeBron's legacy because he couldn't beat them. So I'm super bitter about that because I feel like LeBron should have a lot more championships. So this is like six years ago, though. <laughs> this happened a long time ago. Wow. Like Kevin Durant's been on two different teams since then. And I like the way Kevin Durant plays. So sometimes I'll watch him play, and I'm like, I, I, like, I like the way he plays. Okay, I think I've gotten over it. I think I'm fine. Yeah. But when I hear someone like saying like, "Oh, LeBron's not the goat," he, I, I just jump in like, "Well, it's Kevin Durant, <laughs> he's joined the Warriors," and that's how you know the bitterness lives on. In the same way, I think a lot of us, well, like, it's fine. I see him. I don't feel anything. But when the conversation goes a certain way, wow. when certain topics are brought up, here we are, just bringing it up again. Because the bitterness still lives on in your heart. Do not overestimate the purity of your own heart. Do not underestimate how good you are at disguising and suppressing things. Wow. It's not like, oh, I'm only bitter when the situation comes up. No, it's that's the only situation that is able to show you just how bitter you really still are. Wow. And bitterness will keep us out of heaven. Mm -hmm. I think sometimes up here in our mind, we have forgiven. We've grasped some sort of like conceptual, intellectual level of forgiveness. But the Bible says it judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. If you have not forgiven from your heart... It will keep you from being forgiven by God. Forgiveness is the cure for your bitterness. Yeah. Who do you need to forgive today? Come on. I want to give a simple challenge for you guys today. If you have bitterness that God has exposed in your heart, it's time to deal with it. No more bad attitudes. <laughs> no more blame shifting. Only love for God and love for one another. Amen. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's go, bro. That was point number one. Point number two is purity... Is forged by perseverance. Let's go. And this one's shorter, as I promised. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. The Bible says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and I make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The Bible here says that the Christian life is like a race. It's like a boxing match. These things require ma massive amounts of training, discipline, and mental fortitude. This week is Thanksgiving. It's all about showing our gratitude, showing our thanks. And yet, how is gratitude demonstrated? Is it by what we say? No. Is it about a post you make on Facebook? No. no. That social media, like that selfie at the perfect angle where you're like super straight faced? No. You take different angles like this, this, this is my best angle type picture. With a caption, this is scripture that has nothing to do with the picture. No, that's not how you show gratitude. <laughs> gratitude is demonstrated by what we do. Right. Come on, bro. This week, because it's Thanksgiving, many people are going to check out. And they're going to focus a lot less on how they can serve God and a lot more on how God can serve them. But I want to challenge you guys today. Stay in the race. Stay in the fight. As disciples, we need to show our gratitude to God by what we do. If you are feeling like tapping out, if you feel yourself slowing down, I want to challenge you to get your head back in the game, get yourself back in the fight, and be a disciple this week, too. Come on. I want to close with a quote from Glenn Cunningham. He says, in running, it is a man against himself, the cruelest of opponents. The other runners are not the real enemies. His adversary lies within him. In his ability with mind and heart to master himself and his emotions. I want to challenge you guys today. Don't miss a single quiet time this week. Come on, Jordan. Don't miss a single quiet time. What does that mean? Read your Bible and pray every single day. Yes, even on Thanksgiving. Yeah. And share your faith every day this week. 
Share your faith Amen. every day. Come on. Read your Bible every day. What am I saying? Be a disciple this week. Amen. Come on. Actually obey the Bible this week. Let's embrace the hardship and let us strive for pure hearts. Thank you. That's the lesson. <laughs>